Welcome back to lectures in medical physiology. So we already started looking at the gastrointestinal system and today we'll be looking at the gastrointestinal secretions. So remember, there are four major functions of the GIT. The first one being motility, the second one being secretions, absorption, and digestion. So these are the four major functions of the GIT. But today we are discussing lecture eight that is concentrated much on the secretions. So in the secretions, this is where you are going to find a lot of enzymes that are involved in chemical digestion so that the larger molecules are broken down into smaller monomers and those monomers can be absorbed. So for you to have absorption, you need to start by understanding the secretions that will bring about digestion, then later on absorption. So far, so good. We've already covered the general control of the GIT and some of those mechanisms that control the GIT, we'll be mentioning them here because these secretions, they have to be regulated so that you have specific amount of the secretions that are being introduced to the lumen or the GIT. Okay, so let's start. So it means at the end of the class, you should be able to describe certain secretions that are coming from the segments of the GIT and also the secretions that are coming from the accessory organs, the saliva glands, the pancreas, and also the liver, because the liver is involved in the production of bowel. So you need to know all those secretions and of course the mechanisms that are involved in control of secretions. Okay, so this diagram is just summarizing the fluid input into the digestive system. So the fluids that are introduced into the lumen of the GIT. So on average per day, we introduce about two liters of fluid from the food and the drinks that we eat. So you are eating a lot of food and that food can contain water or fluids then you're also taking some drinks. So on average per day from the food and the drinks that we, we take in, we're introducing two liters of water or fluids into the GIT. Saliva production, we have saliva glands that are producing saliva. On average, we are producing 1.5 liter of saliva. And you know to say the production of saliva is continuous but we have some stimulants that can increase saliva production or inhibit saliva production. Then the liver is producing bowel and bowel production on average is 0.5 liter per day, which is 500 mils of bowel will be introduced to the GIT per day. The stomach, there are gastric secretions that will contain hydrochloric acid and also uh, it will also contain enzymes like pepsin that is being produced as pepsinogen, then it will contain gastric lipase, then it can also contain other electrolytes. So the stomach is secreting about two liters of fluids into the lumen of the stomach. The pancreas is also producing about 1.5 liter of pancreatic secretions per day. The intestines, both the large intestine and the small intestines, they are also secreting intestinal secretions, which is about 1.5 liter per day. So when you do your math here, when you add the total fluid that is introduced into the lumen of the GIT is nine liters per day. Then you need to know that these uh, secretions that are introduced into the lumen, they're not being eliminated from the body. The major part of the fluids are going to be absorbed back into the body itself. So the fluid are removed from the digestive system by the process which is called absorption. So there is absorption process that is taking place there. So about 7.5 liter from the small intestines. So absorption from the small intestines, 7.5 liter. 
then 1.4 liter from the large intestine. When you add the two, you're going to get 8.9, 8.9. Then the overall amount of fluids that are being lost in the fecal material, it's 1.0.1 liter. So 0.1 liter is being excreted. So when you add the values, it will, it will give you nine liters. So out of the nine liters that are being introduced into the lumen of the GIT, you are absorbing 8.9 liter. So the only amount of freeze that you are losing in the fecal material is only a hundred mil, 100 milliliter of fruit or 0 0.1 liter of fruit. So this is balancing because what you are introducing, what you are absorbing and also what you're excreting will be equal. So there will be a steady state in the internal environment. So it needs to be regulated. So the exocrine, they have glands that are secreting secretions into the GIT. So the exocrine or the GIT tracts that are producing the secretions. So what is the composition function of this exocrine? What is the function of the secretions? So they're involved in digestion of food. So to digest the food, because in the secretions, that's where you find a lot of enzymes and those enzymes are involved in digestion. Then they are also involved to dilute the food into the isoosmotic fluid. The isoosmotic fluid are the ones that are going to be absorbed because they won't have an effect on the osmolality of plasma. So during absorption, you find that absorption is taking place for the isoosmotic fluids. So if the chyme is hypertonic or it's hypotonic, you have the secretions that will try to modify the tonicity or the isotonicity of the chyme. Then they'll also provide a favorable pH for digestive enzymes. The enzymes are very sensitive to the pH. So we have enzymes that will operate well at acidic environment, like those that are operating in the stomach, the pepsin, the gastric, lipase, you know to say they operate well at acidic environment. Then we have others that can operate well at slightly acidic environment, and others will operate well at slightly alkaline environment. So the fluids are there to regulate the pH of the chyme in different segments of the GIT to provide the optimum pH at which the enzymes are going to operate. They are also going to provide the mucus for lubrication and protection of all parts of the alimentary tract. So lubrication and protection of all parts of the alimentary tract. So from the secretions, there are mucin that is being secreted by the mucus producing cells. And that mucin will be converted into mucus. That mucus will cover and protect the mucosa cells so that they are not being damaged by the acidity or the chyme that is moving in the lumen. It's not also being uh, damaged by the irritants that can irritate the mucosal cells. So it's there to protect. And also for lubrication, so that the chyme, the bolus can easily move in the lumen of the GIT. Okay, so those are the functions, but they have to be regulated so that you produce specific amount of the fluids in each segment. So we said per day, what you're ingesting is two liter, two liter per day of water, saliva production. We said it's uh, 1.5 liter per day. The pH of saliva is slightly acidic. So 6.8 to seven, that's the pH. The gastric secretions, you are producing two liter per day. The pH cause of hydrochloric acid, which is very strong acid. So the pH is very low there, it's acidic, 1.5 to three. Then we have the, the liver that is producing bowel. Bowel production is 0 0.5 liter per day. Then the pH is 7.8 to 8. 
is producing 500 milliliters of bile per day. And that will be released into the duodenum via the sphincter of Audi. The pancreas is also producing pancreatic secretions. So the pancreatic secretions is 1.5 liter per day. So 1.5 liter per day. It's not milliliter, but it's 1.5 liter per day. In terms of the pH, it's very alkaline because of the bicarbonates that are coming from the pancreas. So the pH is 8 to 8.4. So when you're comparing the gastrointestinal secretions, the secretions that are coming from the pancreas are the ones that will have the highest pH, the highest pH, which is, uh, is 8.4. Then on top of that, there is reabsorption that is taking place. So in the small intestines, they are reabsorbing about 8.4 liter per day. Then the large intestine, they are absorbing about 0.4 liter per day. When you add the two, it will give you 9.9. .9. So it means, I mean, it will give you 8.9, not 9.9. .9. If you add 8.5 plus 0.4, it will give you 8.9. So what you're losing in the fecal material, you're only losing about 0.1 liter per day, okay? So the intestines, they are also involved in secretions. So the intestinal secretions, we already said 1.5 liter, the pH of the intestinal secretions is 7.8 to eight, because they are also secreting a lot of bicarbonates, which are the bases. Now we expand on saliva secretion. So the production of saliva, what is involved, what are the mechanisms that are involved and what is the function of saliva? Why are we producing saliva in the GIT? So the saliva which is being secreted is the first secretion encountered when food is ingested. So when food is ingested, the first secretion that is encountered by the same food is saliva. Saliva is produced by the saliva gland. So saliva is produced by three pairs of saliva glands that drain into the oral cavity. So the principal glands of salivation are the parotid, the submandibular, the sublingual. And in addition, we also have small buccal glands. So in the buccal cavity here, the mucosa or the buccal cavity, you have also saliva glands that can produce mucous saliva. So we also have a bit of buccal glands that are producing saliva. But the major saliva glands are the parotid, the mandibular, and the sublingual, which is under the tongue, hence the name sublingual. The largest of the three pairs of glands is the parotid. So the parotid is the largest, then followed by the submandibular, then the sublingual that is just under the tongue. So all these are producing saliva and via a duct system, they will drain the saliva into the oral cavity. So there are factors that can increase the production or inhibit the production of saliva. So we'll look at control of saliva production. So <clears throat> we say daily secretion of saliva is normally ranging between 800 to 1,800, uh, 1,500 milliliters. So on average per day, each person is producing about 800 to 1,500 milliliters of saliva per day at the rate of 0 0.5 milliliters per minute. So in every minute, you are producing about 0 0.5 mils of saliva. So the saliva contains two types of protein secretions. So there are two major types of protein secretions, two major types of saliva. It could be serous saliva. So serous saliva contains a protein, which is called tylene. The tylene is the other name for saliva amylase, which is an enzyme for digesting starch. So cooked starch, cooked starch can be digested in the oral cavity by the salivary amylase. So saliva amylase is found within serous secretions. Then we have another type of saliva, which is called mucus secretions or mucus saliva that contain a lot of mucin and mucin for lubricating and for surface protective purposes. 
So it's going to protect the surfaces, like I explained, because mucin is going to be converted into mucus. So in the oral cavity, in the saliva, there is a lot of mucus that is being produced here. So depending on the type of the gland, so the parotid gland is more serous than the submandibular, the mandibular gland. So you have the, the parotid and <clears throat> the submandibular and the sublingual. So the parotid is more of serous. The submandibular uh, is a mixed gland, so it can produce mucus and serous. Then the sublingual is more of mucus, so it produces a lot of uh, mucus. Okay, but it depends with the textbooks you are using as well. So the parotid gland secretes almost entirely the serous type of secretions. This is what I meant. The submandibular and the sublingual, they will secrete both serous secretions and mucus, but other textbooks will just tell you to say the submandibular is the one that is mixed, and the sublingual is more of mucus in nature. So it's producing more of mucus secretions. Then the buccal cavity, these are entirely mucus, so they produce a lot of mucus. Saliva has the pH of eight, uh, 6.0 to 7.0 a favorable range for the digestive action of tylen. So tylen works very well in that range of pH. So you need this pH to be maintained. So the saliva can also produce buffer systems that will regulate, that will try to resist change in the pH within the oral cavity. The saliva glands that are producing saliva, they contain mucus cells and also serous cells. So mucus cells are the ones that are producing mucus secretions. The serous cells are the ones that are producing serous secretions. So the mucus cells will form the mucus alveolus. That is a group of cells that are producing uh, mucus secretions into the duct system. Then the serous, they will form the serous alveolus that is also producing serous secretions. Serous uh, secretions contains a lot of salivary amylase. Mucus contain a lot of mucin. Then you can see some of these uh, mixed alveoli. So you can have mixed alveoli that will contain both the serous and the mucus cells. So they're producing both serous and also mucus secretions. Okay, so the parotid gland will have more of these mixed alveoli. The sub submandibular will have more of the serous, then the sublingual will have more of the mucus. So the submandibular is mixed also, just like the, the parotid. The parotid mainly is, is serous in nature, so it's producing more of uh, the enzyme that is the parotid, but the submandibular is the one that is mixed, so it will have the mixed alveoli, but the sublingual will have more of mucus cells that is producing mucus. Okay, so this is the same information again. So the saliva glands, we have the serous glands that are watery secretions that contain a lot of enzymes. An example is the parotid. So the parotid uh, saliva glands produces a lot of salivary amylase. So it's serous in nature. Then you have mucus glands that are producing a lot of mucins and the mucins are converted into the mucus. An example here is sublingual saliva glands and also small intestinal glands. So those are mucus glands. Then you have mixed exocrine glands. The mixed exocrine glands, they will have both serous cells and mucus cells. An example is the submandibular saliva glands that will produce both the serous and mucus secretions. What are some of the functions of saliva? Okay, so the functions of saliva, it's very easy for a student to answer this question because you can, you can give it a guess. It's something that you do on a daily basis. So you're producing saliva. So why are you producing saliva? Think of the answers when you get it. So the functions of saliva, the first one, it will facilitate swallowing by lubricating food with mucin. So swallowing, deglutition, reflex. So swallowing is facilitated by saliva because saliva produces mucin and mucin facilitate the formation of the bolus and also covers the bolus 
in mucus. So it's very easy for you to swallow. So the deglutition process is going to be facilitated by the mucus. Digestive function, of course, we have saliva amylase. So there is chemical digestion that is taking place within the oral cavity. So in the oral cavity, you have both mechanical and chemical digestion. Mechanical by the tip that is breaking down the food particles into smaller, smaller particles. And then you have the enzyme that will start the digestion of starch, especially cooked starch. Then the saliva is involved to keep the mouth moist. So the mouth is not dry. Why? It's because of saliva. So the saliva will keep the mouth moist so it doesn't dry out. Then it serves as a solvent for the molecules that simulate the test buds. So for a person to appreciate test sensation, the chemicals they need to dissolve in saliva and those chemicals they go and stimulate the test cells. So we have the test cells that are contained within the test buds. So for them to be stimulated, they need to sense the presence of chemicals because they have chemoreceptors. So those chemoreceptors are responding to chemicals that are dissolved in saliva. So for you to appreciate test, you need saliva. It's also going to help in speech. So the way I'm talking right now in this lecture, saliva is helping me because it's replicating the lips and also the movement of the tongue. So saliva is going to help the movement of the lips and the tongue. Saliva also contain immunoglobulins. So saliva contains immunoglobulins, which are antibodies that will be directed against the microorganisms in the mouth. Remember the mouth is, is very near to the outside environment. So there are some pathogenic microbes that can find their way into the oral cavity because the mouth is always open. When I'm speaking, it's open. So there could be some bacteria that can find their way into the oral cavity. So saliva will contain a lot of immunoglobulins, which are antibodies to fight against those pathogens. Then it also contains a lot of lysosomes. And lysosomes, you know, to say these are cell organelles that are capable of digesting anything because at the center of the lysosomes, you have a complex of enzymes that are capable of digesting either protein, carbohydrate, lipid, nucleic acids. So whatever is pushed into the lysosome, it will be digested. So saliva or even tears, they contain a lot of lysosomes. Those lysosomes, they are defensive uh, cell organelles. And you know to say that they are involved in uh, waste disposal. So if they are within the cells, they are the waste disposal sites within the cells. If they are in the saliva, they will fight the pathogens that can be found in the saliva. So the bacterial membrane will be destroyed by the rhizosomes and the immunoglobulins. Saliva also contain buffer. So the buffer in the saliva is going to help maintain the oral pH at somewhere around zero. So we say the pH of the saliva is eight, is six to seven, somewhere there. Other textbooks will just say 6.8 to seven, which is slightly acidic. So that pH needs to be maintained. So the maintenance of the pH in the oral cavity is facilitated by the buffer systems that are found in saliva. So you can find a lot of bicarbonates and other buffer that are found in saliva to maintain the pH. They also help neutralize gastric acid and relieve heartburn when gastric secretions is regurgitated into the esophagus. So during vomiting, there's movement of gastric secretions or gastric fluids move into the esophagus and upwards towards the oral cavity. So the oral cavity needs to protect itself mm -hmm. from the acids. So you find that in the saliva, it will contain a lot of uh, buffer systems that will neutralize the acid, like I mentioned. So it will also prevent the heart pain because the saliva that we are swallowing is going to neutralize the acid in the esophagus. So that will prevent heart pain. Okay. So this table or diagram is just summarizing the functions of saliva. So it's very easy to remember. So functions of saliva, we have some uh, functions of saliva on the food that we're eating or function of saliva on the teeth in the oral cavity. 
And we also have some functions of saliva on the microorganisms that are proliferating within the oral cavity. So what are the functions of saliva on the food that we're eating? So it's involved in digestion of the food we are eating, tests, for you to appreciate tests, the chemicals needs to dissolve in saliva, then also bolus formation. So bolus formation, you need the, the mucus that is part of saliva and also lubricating the bolus to facilitate swallowing. So you have the mucus in the water that is part of saliva. Then the function of saliva on the teeth, we have the buffer system like the bicarbonates, the phosphates and the proteins that can neutralize the acid or to resist change in the pH. Then on the teeth again, it will protect the teeth against demineralization. So it's, it will protect the teeth against demineralization. Then it will also protect the teeth. It will provide mineralization because in the saliva we have minerals and those minerals will be deposited on the teeth. Okay, the white part of the teeth. So you find that mineralization of the teeth is taking place because in the saliva you have calcium, you have phosphates and the other uh, proteins that are involved in mineralization of the teeth. Then on the teeth again, lubrication, because the saliva will cover the teeth to lubricate it. And then you know to say that saliva, 98% of saliva is water that is also involved in lubrication. So you have mucin and other uh, substances that can lubricate the, the teeth itself. Then on the microorganisms, they could be bacteria or viruses. So saliva has got antiviral property. So they are antiviral proteins like the mucins, immunoglobulins, all these uh, proteins, they are against the, the production or proliferation of some certain viruses, or they can actually kill certain viruses. So the saliva has got antiviral proteins that can kill the viruses. And then you also have antifungal proteins that can actually damage the fungi or fungus. Then we also have antibacterial, so like the rhizosomes and certain immunoglobulins, all those, they can attack the bacteria. So it's just a summary of the functions that we've already discussed. Making progress, let's look at the composition of saliva. So saliva contains a large number of inorganic and organic constituents. So we have some organic substances and inorganic substances. But you know to say that the most abundant part of saliva is water. So 98% is water, and then the remaining 2% are the inorganic and organic substances. So the 2% will form the electrolytes and other organic components of the mu uh, mucus. So this table again is summarizing the composition of saliva. So we have the oral fluid, which is called saliva. The whole saliva is composed of the solids and water. So water is the major part, 98.4 to 99% is water. Then the solids is just 0.6 to 1%. These solids are divided into organic and inorganic substances. So you have organic and inorganic substances. The inorganic substances, mainly here you have electrolytes. And then the organic substances, here you have proteins, carbohydrates and non-protein like lipids. So non-proteins and lipids. So proteins and carbohydrates, proteins, of course, some of them are enzymes and microbial proteins and also mucus. Then serum, you know, serum, you have plasma proteins or serum is simply plasma without coating factors. So this is coming from the bloodstream. So it's part of the proteins as well. So this is a composition of saliva. Okay, so of course we have a lot of electrolytes that will include sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, bicarbonates, and phosphates. Then the mucus is composed of mucopolysaccharides, like glycoproteins and other enzymes. So the mucus contain a lot of mucopolysaccharides. So you know to say saliva contains mucus. So that's why saliva is sticky because of the mucus 
even when people are kissing, sometimes you can see a string of mucus, you know, extending from one lip to another lip. Okay, so that tells you to say, in the saliva, there is mucus. Maybe that can discourage certain people to kiss, especially students. So whenever you're about to kiss your girlfriend, think of the mucus to say what you're going to kiss is actually mucopolysaccharides and glycoproteins, which are mucus. You are kissing mucus. So the pH of the resting saliva is acidic. So the pH is acidic slightly acidic anyway. Mechanism of saliva production and secretion. So what are the mechanisms that are involved in saliva production and secretion? The arsenas, these are arsenide cells that will produce the initial saliva with a composition similar to that of plasma. So if the composition of electrolytes is similar to that of plasma, this initial saliva is called isotonic saliva. Remember, when you are describing the tonicity of solutions, we said if a solution has got the same osmolality compared to that of plasma, it's called isotonic. If the osmolality is greater than that of plasma, it's called hypertonic. If the osmolality is less compared to that of plasma, it's called hypotonic. So the osmolality, you're looking at the number of dissolved particles in solution. How many of these dissolved particles are there in solution? So if the number of dissolved particles are similar to that of plasma, it's called isotonic. So this initial saliva that is being produced, it will be isotonic and it has the same concentration of sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonates when you compare it to that of plasma. So because the initial saliva that is being produced, it does got a similar uh, osmolality to that of plasma, it's called isotonic saliva, which makes sense because these cells, they are just involved in filtration of plasma into the production of saliva in the saliva glands. So you have the arsenal cells that are producing saliva. They are just pushing this uh, uh, plasma from the circulation into the duct system of the saliva glands. So the initial saliva that will be produced, it will be isotonic. Then as this saliva is moving within the duct system, we have the duct cells that will modify the saliva. So the initial saliva now will start undergoing modification. The modification involves reabsorption and secretion of certain electrolytes that will now change the osmolality of saliva. So the final saliva at the end, you realize to say it to be hypotonic. I'll explain how it becomes hypotonic. So the mechanisms of saliva production and secretion, so the duct cells, they are going to reabsorb sodium and chloride. So the duct cells that are lining the duct system, they are the ones that are involved in modification of saliva. So they are reabsorbing much of the sodium and chloride. So therefore the concentration of these ions will be lower than their plasma concentration. Because we said the initial saliva is isotonic. So if the duct cells are reabsorbing sodium and chloride, it means that they are removing the sodium and chloride from the saliva. So the saliva will have less concentration of sodium and chloride, uh, and chloride as compared to that of plasma, which makes sense, right? Then the ducts can also secrete potassium and bicarbonates. So now they are introducing more potassium and bicarbonate into the saliva. So therefore the concentration of these ions, which is potassium and bicarbonate, it will be higher than their plasma concentration. So now the concentration of bicarbonate and potassium is going to be higher than that in plasma. There are also other hormones that will have an effect on the saliva, especially the electrolytes in saliva. Aldestrone is one of them. So the aldestrone will act on the ductal cells to increase the reabsorption of sodium at the expense of potassium. So potassium is being secreted, sodium is being reabsorbed. It's the same effect that you're going to see in the renal distal tubule. So in the kidney nephron, 
their segments there, the proximal, the loop of Henry, and the distal convoluted tubule. So there are certain hormones that will have an effect on those epithelium cells. So the aldestron, it will have the same effect in the kidneys as it will have on the uh, duct cells that are modifying the saliva. So it will enhance reabsorption of sodium in exchange for potassium that is being secreted into the lumen of the salivary glands. Okay. So the saliva becomes hypotonic in the ducts because the ducts are relatively impermeable to water. So as the duct cells are reabsorbing much of the sodium and much of the chloride, they are secreting potassium and bicarbonate, the reabsorption processes are more as compared to the secretory processes. So overall, you find that the duct cells are removing much of the electrolytes than they are introducing the electrolytes. So the concentration of these electrolytes will reduce. So the overall concentration of electrolytes will reduce. The osmolality is going to reduce. So it means that the saliva now becomes hypotonic. And on top of that, I've said that the duct cells are relatively impermeable to water. So water is not being reabsorbed. So if the volume of the water is increasing, the concentration of electrolytes is reducing, it means that the, the osmolality is going to reduce. So this saliva, it makes sense that it will be hypotonic. So the final saliva that will be produced will be hypotonic. So this is a diagram that is summarizing those fancy processes that seem to be uh, complicated when they are just simple. So you can see you have the arsenal cells. The arsenal cells are the ones that are involved in production of the initial saliva, then to be transported by the duct system. In the duct system, we have these special epithelium cells, which are called the ductal cells. So the ductal cells are the ones that are involved in modification of saliva. So the initial saliva is plasma-like solution, which is called isotonic saliva. It's introduced into the lumen by the arsenal cells. So this is kind of filtration taking place here, filtration of plasma, okay? So you won't have the cells, but you have most of the electrolytes. That's why the, the tonicity is almost the same. You have isotonic saliva being produced. So as the saliva is moving, there is more reabsorption of sodium and more reabsorption of chloride. So you can see the reabsorbing processes are more as compared to the secreting processes. So the secretion of potassium and bicarbonates. So the secretion is less as compared to the reabsorption. So the concentration of electrolytes is going to reduce. So the final saliva will be hypotonic. And the other reason is because the duct cells are relatively impermeable to water. So when you are reabsorbing sodium, there is less water that is being reabsorbed again. So the water volume here is going to increase. You have less electrolytes that will have an effect on the osmolality. So you have less osmolality compared to that of plasma, hence the name hypotonic, hypotonic saliva. This is modification of saliva by the duct cells. So it's the same information, modification of the saliva by the duct cells. So the first one here, the saliva that is being produced by the arsenal cells is isotonic. And then as the saliva is moving, is going to be modified. But remember, you have the myoepithelium cells. So the contraction of these myoepithelium cells, they can squeeze the saliva glands to push the saliva so that you have more saliva that will be uh, drained into the oral cavity. That is the function of the myoepithelium cells. So they are more like special smooth muscle cells. Okay, so the duct cells are the ones that are modifying the saliva. So you can see the ion channels that are involved here. So ion channels and ion pumps that are involved here. So on the basolateral side of these epi duct epithelium cells, you have sodium potassium HPS pump that is exchanging sodium for potassium. That this sodium is being introduced by the sodium hydrogen exchanger. So on the apical side, on the apical side of these ductal cells, we, you have sodium hydrogen exchanger. So they are exchanging sodium for hydrogen. 
So sodium is being reabsorbed. Uh, hydrogen ions are being pushed into the lumen. Then you also have chloride bicarbonate exchanger. So they are reabsorbing chloride at the expense of bicarbonates. So the bicarbonates are being uh, secreted into the lumen. The hydrogen ions that was exchanged for sodium, it will be exchanged with potassium. So you have hydrogen potassium exchanger. So the cells are gaining hydrogen ions, they are losing potassium. So potassium is being secreted into the lumen. So overall, you have reabsorption of sodium and chloride. Then you have secretion of potassium and bicarbonates. The sodium concentration is going to increase within the cell. Then that is going to be uh, controlled by sodium potassium ATPS pump. That is pumping sodium into the interstitium, and then it will be absorbed by the bloodstream, then in, in exchange for potassium. So you know sodium potassium HPS pump is pumping three sodium, it's introducing two potassium. So the concentration of potassium here uh, is going to increase within the cell, but the concentration of sodium is going to reduce. So the reduction in the concentration gradient for sodium is going to enhance this pump now, or this protein that is exchanging sodium for um, hydrogen ions. So these are antiport proteins that are involved here to exchange certain electrolytes. Okay, so that was covered during cell physiology. So we are just applying the knowledge that we've already learned at some point. Same information modification that I've already explained. So we proceed, even here, it's just showing the modification by the duct cells. So what I want to explain here is the reaction that is taking place. So carbon dioxide can come from the capillaries. You know, the tissues are producing a lot of carbon dioxide. They are using oxygen in the um, oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation reaction that is taking place in the mitochondria. So they are using a lot of oxygen then the Krebs cycle is producing a lot of carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide can enter the ductal cells. So it will react with water within the ductal cells. So carbon dioxide is reacting with water under the influence of carbonic anhydrase. So the carbonic anhydrase is the one that is catalyzing this reaction to produce carbonic acid, which you can see here. The carbonic acid is so weak, it's going to dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonates. The hydrogen ions are the ones that are being exchanged with sodium. So you can see hydrogen ions are being exchanged with sodium. Then the sodium is being pumped by sodium potassium ATPS pump to create the concentration gradient. Then you can see here you have sodium that is also being exchanged for potassium. So you have sodium potassium ATPS pump on the apical side of the cells as well. They're internalizing sodium, they're losing potassium. And then you have chloride bicarbonate exchanger that is exchanging chloride for bicarbonates. So overall, you have this sodium that is being internalized. You have this chloride that is being internalized by the cell. Then you have the potassium and the bicarbonates that are being secreted. So the processes that are involved in reabsorption of sodium and chloride are more as compared to the processes that are secreting potassium and chloride. So the concentration of electrolytes is going to reduce, then the osmolality is going to decrease, then the saliva becomes hypotonic. This is a table that is also summarizing uh, the effect of stimulating the saliva glands. So we have resting saliva and stimulated saliva in plasma. So you're just comparing resting saliva, stimulated saliva, and plasma. What is the difference between resting saliva and stimulated saliva? Resting saliva, it means that the movement of saliva is somehow slow. That will provide enough time for the duct cells to modify the saliva. But the stimulated saliva, when the saliva glands are stimulated, the production of saliva is going to increase then the flow of saliva in the duct system is also going to increase. So if the flow of saliva is increasing, there is no enough time for those duct cells to modify. So there will be less of reabsorption and secretion that is taking place. So it will have an effect on the osmolality. So you can check at your own time each electrolyte, how it's affected when the, the saliva is resting or when it's stimulated. Okay.
So we we'll proceed to look at the nervous regulation of the salivary secretion. So now how is saliva production regulated by the nervous system? So the nervous system that will have an effect on saliva production is the autonomic nervous system, especially the cranial nerves that are innervating the saliva glands. So you have the cranial nerves that are, uh, that are that are innervating the saliva glands. So once they are stimulated, those cranial nerves, they can increase the production of saliva. So let's get into the information. So the saliva glands are controlled mainly by the parasympathetic nervous signals all the way from the superior and the inferior salivatory nuclei in the brain stem. So there are two nuclei that are the center to control the production of saliva and secretion of saliva. So those two nuclei, they are found in the brain stem. So we have the superior and the inferior salivatory nuclei that are between the pons and the medulla oblongata. So at that junction between the pons and the medulla oblongata, this is where you find the salivatory nuclei. So the salivatory nuclei are located at the juncture of the medulla and the pons and are excited by both test and tactile stimuli from the tongue and other areas of the mouth and the pharynx. So in the oral cavity, there are receptors, sensory receptors that can be stimulated by touch or tactile stimuli. Then there are also other receptors that are stimulated by tests. So they are called test receptors. So they are responding to chemicals that are found in the food that will be dissolved in saliva during mastication processes. That's why you are mixing the, the food that you're chewing there with saliva. So once those receptors, they are sensory receptors, so if they are stimulated, they are going to generate a receptor potential and those receptor potential will stimulate now the sensory fiber to transmit an action potential. So those action potentials that are transmitted, it will be via the cranial nerves. So remember some of the cranial nerves are mixed nerves. So they have the motor and the sensory parts. So the sensory part of the cranial nerves, they will house the sensory nerve fiber that will be transmitting action potentials to the salivatory nuclei within the brain stem. So they are projecting this information. So once the salivatory nuclei receive the action potentials, there will be stimulatory neurotransmitters that will be released there. Then they will integrate the information. That's why they are the integratory center. So they are going to interpret the information to say, to say that they, there is uh, food particles that have been introduced. The person is chewing. So now the salivatory nuclei, they are going to send uh, another motor information via the, the efferent fibers. So you have the motor fibers via these cranial nerves, they need to be transmitted to the saliva glands to increase the production of saliva. So the pr production of saliva, it increases. So it becomes stimulated saliva to some extent. So saliva production increases when somebody is chewing. Why? It's because of the reflexes that would be initiated by the presence of food in the oral cavity. Okay, and then the sympathetic inputs slightly modifies the composition of saliva, particularly by increasing the protein content of saliva. So the protein, remember, you have the mucus and this, the enzymes. So you find that the enzymes in the mucus is going to increase when you have sympathetic stimulation. So the enzymes in the mucus in the saliva is going to increase. This is what I was trying to explain, maybe explaining it from the diagram, it will be very easy for a student to understand. So you can see the cranial nerves that are innervating the structures in the oral cavity. So the tongue is innervated by the glossopharyngeal fibers, and also the fascial nerve. So you can see some of the branch of the fascial nerve that is innervating the tongue. So on this tongue, you have tactile receptors and test receptors. The presence of the food is going to stimulate these sensory receptors 
then it will trigger an action potential that will be transmitted via the cranial nerves, especially the fascial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. Then these nerves, they will fire to the superior and the inferior salivatory nuclei. So there are interneurons here that are releasing stimulatory neurotransmitters to the center, to the inferior and superior salivatory nuclei. Then once the salivatory nuclei are stimulated, they will generate another motor information via the motor neurons, which are also part of the cranial nerve. So the facial nerve and also the glossopharyngeal nerve. So you can see that these are being stimulated now. That's why these are called mixed nerves, the fascial nerve and the glossopharyngeal. So they have the sensory part and the motor part, the motor part. So the motor part are the ones that are innervating the parotid and also other glands. So the parotid, the, um, the sublingual and the submandibular glands, they are innervated by these cranial nerves. So they are going to release acetylcholine because this is the parasympathetics. So they are going to release acetylcholine and acetylcholine will have an effect on the production of saliva. So the, the amount of saliva is going to increase because of acetylcholine. But just not to say that the sympathetic also has got an effect. So you have the sympathetic ganglia in the neck that can send innervation to these structures that can also enhance the production of saliva, especially the protein part of saliva. So this is the only location whereby the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, they are not opposing one another. So they are not opposing one another here. Both systems are going to stimulate the production of saliva. Okay, so in the oral cavity, the parasympathetic and the sympathetics, they are not going to be antagonistic here. They are going to work in synergy. So there is a synergic function of parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So they are going to enhance the production of saliva here, only here. They are not opposing one another. Okay, so what are some of the stimuli that can inhibit salivation and that can stimulate salivation? We have conditioned reflexes that can stimulate the salivatory nucleus or the salivary nucleus. Remember the inferior and the superior salivatory nuclei, they can be stimulated by conditioned reflexes. So what are these conditioned reflexes? I'll give you an example of a dog. So if at your place you have a dog and this dog, you know, is just a natural dog. So it can respond to natural stimuli, okay? So if you're giving the dog food, you know, to say the smell of food, the dog will start salivating. So that salivating is because of the smell of the food and the sight of food, the dog will start salivating because those are natural stimuli. But now if you associate the natural stimuli with a natural stimuli, something which is not natural, a natural stimuli, maybe ringing of a bell. So let's say every time you want to give your dog food, you ring a bell, then you give it food. Every time you want to give your dog food, you ring a bell, then you give it food. So you find that the ringing of a bell becomes a stimuli to the dog. Next time when you just ring a bell, the dog will think that what will follow is food. So it will start salivating. So you see that the unconditioned stimuli is now stimulating the dog to salivate, even if food is not there. The moment it just uh, hears the bell, then it will start salivating. So these are some of the unconditioned reflexes that can be associated with conditioned reflexes. And uh, I mean, these are conditioned reflexes that can be associated with the natural reflexes. So you find that in the wrong line, they become a stimuli. So they can stimulate the salivatory nuclei, then the person can start salivating. Then of course you have the, the smell of nice food, taste of nice food, nausea, all these are stimulatory. So if you go to the restaurant and then there's a smell of very nice food, you start salivating even before you are given the food to eat. Even just the taste, 
once you are given the food and then you test, the food is very nice. You find that even the saliva, uh, salivation will increase. So you start producing a lot of saliva because that they can be stimulatory to the saliva in nucleus. Then nausea, nausea is the feeling that you're about to vomit. Even before you start vomiting, there's just that unpleasant feeling that you're about to vomit. So that nausea can also stimulate the salivatory nucleus because the body knows to say you're going to vomit. If you are vomiting, you are vomiting hydrochloric acid that can be harmful to the teeth or to the oral cavity. So the, the oral cavity will prepare itself to produce a lot of saliva. In that saliva, you have bicarbonates that will neutralize the acid. So it's a protective mechanism that will be initiated. So nausea can stimulate the, the salivary nucleus so that you produce a lot of saliva. Then we have factors or stimuli that will inhibit salivation. So some of these factors is sleep. When a person is sleeping, they are not supposed to produce a lot of saliva. Why? It's because you are not conscious at that point, you are sleeping. So if you are producing a lot of saliva, you can end up, uh, the saliva can end up going to the trachea. So it will bring about aspiration pneumonia. Okay, so to prevent that, God just designed the human body that sleep itself can be inhibitory to the salivatory nucleus. Then fear, fatigue. If you are fatigued, you find that you produce less of saliva, even your oral cavity is dry. As a student, you are studying, you know, you're not eating, there's too much stress. Your, your mouth is, is just dry. Why? It's because of fatigue, sometimes because of fear. Dehydration will also minimize the uh, production of saliva because the body doesn't have a lot of fluids. So the, the rate at which saliva is being produced to be reduced, okay? Because you don't want to be losing a lot of fluids when you are already dehydrated. So you find that dehydration can inhibit the salivary nucleus. The salivary nucleus will stimulate another pathway, which is the parasympathetics. So if the salivatory nucleus is stimulated, it's going to transmit action potentials via the parasympathetics in the cranionids. That will, the postganglionic nerve in the parasympathetics, they are mainly releasing acetylcholine that will go and bind to mascarinic receptors to mobilize calcium and calcium is required for exocytosis is also required to translocate certain um, iron pumps that are involved in the production and modification of saliva. Then here you can see the sympathetics. Once there is sympathetic stimulation via the superior cervical ganglia. So this is the superior cervical ganglia, which is parasympathetic ganglia. So you have the post ganglionic nerve fiber that is releasing no epinephrine. So the no epinephrine will go and bind to G-protein coupled receptors that will increase the cyclic AMP as a second messenger. So the cyclic AMP as a second messenger has got an effect on protein kinase A and the protein kinase A can cause translocation of certain channels or exocytosis of mucus and also enzymes. So enzyme production and secretion is going to increase when you have sympathetic stimulation. So all this will increase the secretion of saliva. Okay, so there will be an increase in the secretion of saliva. And then the sympathetic can also cause myoepithelium contraction. So if myoepithelium, they are contracting, they are squeezing the sali uh, saliva glands and most, much of the saliva is being drained into the oral cavity. Okay. So this uh, diagram is, is similar to the previous one. So I won't spend much time here. So you can see conditioning here coming again, the food, nausea, smell, all these are stimulatory. Dehydration, fear, sleep, anticholinergics, drugs, they are going to inhibit the salivation. So these factors can uh, stimulate the parasympathetic or inhibit the parasympathetics. So the anticholinergic drugs like acetylcholine is going to inhibit the interaction between acetylcholine and mascarinic receptors. Remember, if acetylcholine goes and bind to mascarinic receptors, it will uh, trigger the production of IP3 via the G-protein coupled receptors. 
because you know to say acetylcholine can come and bind to acetylcholine receptors, which are masculinic receptors, then that can cause activation of the G protein. So this G protein is coupled with a receptor, hence the name G protein coupled receptors. So if acetylcholine binds there, it activates the G protein. So the alpha protein subunit will dissociate itself from the beta gamma protein subunit. Then the beta gamma protein subunit will say it, it can go and activate phospholipase C. Once phospholipase C is activated, it will break down phosphatidylinositobisphosphate into DAG or diacylglycyl molecule and IP3. IP3 is inositotriphosphate. The inositotriphosphate can go and bind to inositotriphosphate receptors of the endoplasmic reticulum to mobilize calcia. So calcia will be mobilized from the endoplasmic reticulum and this calcium can go and, um, uh, and facilitate exocytosis. So in order to say calcium can go and bind to V-snare, T-snare interaction, like synaptobrevin syntaxing interaction, that will bring about exocytosis of the saliva. So saliva production is going to increase under the influence of acetylcholine. So the parasympathetics, they are going to increase the production of saliva. And also the sympathetics can also increase the production of saliva. Why? It's because the norepinephrine is going to bind to beta uh, receptors. So you have these beta receptors that are being stimulated by no, epinephrine that will increase the production of second messenger, which is cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP can go and activate the protein kinase, and then it can cause translocation of certain channels and also exocytosis of proteins. So the acina cells, they will increase saliva production. So you can see both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic here, they are not opposing one another. So this is the only point whereby both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic is going to stimulate the production of saliva. So they work hand in hand to increase the production of saliva. So that's it with saliva production, the control of saliva, the centers, the neural control, and of course we have the hormonal control of saliva production. So we have hormones that are gonna have an effect on saliva production. Okay, you've noticed that pregnant women, if a woman is pregnant, so those women that are pregnant, sometimes they spit a lot. Why? It's because saliva production is increased when the person is uh, pregnant because some of the hormones can have an effect on the production of saliva. Okay, some of them, they'll have nausea, they will start vomiting because they can also have an effect on vomiting center. So those are some exceptions that you need to know to say, if the person is pregnant, then there could be some other factors that will have an effect on the centers in the brain that are regulating the production of saliva or that are triggering vom uh, vomiting and other physiological function that can be affected by pregnancy. Okay, so we are moving down to the esophagus. So you have esophageal secretion. So the esophagus can also secrete because there are mucus producing cells there, the mucosa or the esophagus, there are cells that are also producing some secretions. So the esophageal secretions are entirely mucus in character and principally provide lubrication for swallowing simple mucus glands and also compound mucus glands are found there. So you have surface mucus producing cells that will produce a lot of mucus and the function of those mucus is for lubrication. And also the, some of these mucus, they contain a lot of bicarbonates and those bicarbonates are involved in neutralization of the acids. So at the gastric end and in the initial portion of the esophagus, there are also many compound mucus glands. So at the start of the stomach, so you have cardiac sphincter there. So at the gastric end where you have the cardiac sphincter, at the gastric end of the esophagus where you have the cardiac sphincter or lower esophageal sphincter, you will find there are a lot of compound mucus glands there and also the initial portion of the esophagus. Because the initial portion of the esophagus, we have the upper esophageal sphincter that is supposed to receive the bolus. 
So you have a lot of compound mucus glands that produces a lot of mucus. So in case maybe the bolus is not well lubricated, you need to have a lot of mucus in the upper part of the esophagus to receive the bolus. Then towards the end of the lower esophageal sphincter, you have a lot of compound um, glands as well there that will produce a lot of mucus and this mucus will contain a lot of bicarbonates. So in case you have regurgitation of hydrochloric acid into the esophagus, so this mucus will protect the mucosa of the esophagus and it will also neutralize the acid, okay? So it will also prevent gastric, I mean, uh, it will prevent heart bends. So heart bends because you have the compound uh, muca uh, glands that are producing mucus, and this mucus contained bicarbonates to neutralize the acid and also to protect the mucosa or the, the mucosa or the esophagus. Okay, otherwise, if you don't have that, you can have peptic ulcers. So the hydrochloric acid will start damaging the mucosa. That will result in two peptic ulcer. So the upper esophagus, the mucus that is there is going to prevent mucosal excoriation or excoriation. So excoriation means shading off on the mucosa. Maybe if you swallow the bolus, which is very dry, and that bolus can scratch on the mucosa that will cause excoriation of the mucosa. So you need a lot of mucus there that will prevent the excoriation of the mucosa. Then the lower esophagus where you have the cardiac sphincter or lower esophageal sphincter, you also have more production of saliva there. I mean, not saliva, but mucus. And that mucus is going to protect the esophageal wall from digestion by the acidic gastric secretions. So you have the hydrochloric acid. So it needs to protect itself from the hydrochloric acid. Otherwise, if that protection is not enough, then peptic ulcers will start there. Okay, moving on to gastric secretions. So once we are done with gastric secretions, that will end. Then uh, the next lecture, we'll look at the secretions in the small intestines, large intestines. Okay, so without wasting time, let's discuss gastric secretions. So you need to be able to understand what sort of secretions is taking place in the stomach and those secretions, how are they regulated? So the anatomical consideration of the stomach. So the stomach is divided into certain anatomical regions. So the first part is called the lower esophageal sphincter, which is also referred to as the cardia. Then we have the fundus and the body. The body has got the proximal part and the distal part of the body. Then we have the antrum. So the body and the fundus will contain cells that will secrete mucus, pepsinogen, and hydrochloric acid, as you can see in this diagram. Then the antrum of the, of the stomach will contain cells that will secrete mucus, pepsinogen, and gastrin. So you have a lot of G cells in the atrium that is producing a lot of G cells. Okay, so this is just a general information. So the gastric secretions arise from the glands in the wall of the stomach that drain into the lumen and also from the surface cells that secrete primarily mucus and bicarbonates to protect the stomach from digesting itself. So you have the mucus bicarbonate layer that is pro protecting the stomach itself because the stomach is producing a lot of hydrochloric acid and the mucosal cells they don't survive well in acidic environment. So you find that they are covered by the mucus, then they are also producing a lot of bicarbonates so that, that hydrochloric acid doesn't get to the cells. So in the lumen of the stomach, the pH could be 1.5 to 3, but the surface or the mucosal cells or those epithelium cells, you find that the pH there is somewhere around seven, almost neutral. So that is possible because of the mucus that is covering in the bicarbonate layer that will neutralize the acid. So the glandular secretions of stomach differ in different regions of the organ itself. So there are a lot of secretions. But in general, the gastric pits, they contain different types of cells that are responsible for production of these secretions. 
So in this diagram, it's just summarizing those cells and what they are producing. So we have surface mucus producing cells that are producing mucus. Then we have the neck cells, the mucus neck cells that are producing mucus. So the neck, mucus neck cells, they're producing mucus that can also protect the lining of the stomach. Then going down, we have the parietal cells. These shown in yellow are called parietal cells. So the parietal cells, they are producing gastric acid, which is the hydrochloric acid. Then they are also producing intrinsic factor. So the intrinsic factor is required for absorption of vitamin B12, okay? And a bit of calcium absorption, but mainly is responsible for vitamin B12 absorption. That's why if you're lacking intrinsic factor, a person is more prone to pernicious anemia because the uh, vitamin B12 is required for maturation of red blood cells in the erythropoiesis process. So if there is less vitamin B12, there is less maturation of red blood cells, then you have pernicious anemia, which is a megaloblastic anemia because the cells will be bigger than normal. The red blood cell, you have immature red blood cells, which could be the reticulocytes or immature red blood cells that contain a nucleus inside that is very big because the development of the cells requires that the nucleus is supposed to be removed from the red blood cell. Then they become mature without the nuclei. But if you're lacking vitamin B12, there is no maturation of a red blood cell. So they will be very big. The red blood cell, when they're uh, they, they undergoing maturation, they are reducing in diameter. So in, in the size of the red blood cells become smaller as the red blood cells undergo maturation. So without vitamin B12, there is no maturation of red blood cells. The red blood cells will be very big. Then you have megaloblastic anemia, which is a special type of uh, pernicious anemia. Or pernicious anemia is a special type of megaloblastic anemia. Okay, so the parietal cells are producing uh, gastric acid and also intrinsic factor. Then we also have the enterochromaffin-like cells. So the ECL cells, the enterochromaffin-like cells that will produce histamine. And the histamine in turn will stimulate the parietal cells to produce a lot of hydrochloric acid. Then on top of that, we have the chief cells. So they are the chief cells in the gastric pits. What do they produce? The major thing, right? Which is pepsinogen. So the chief cells will be producing pepsinogen. Then we also have gastric lipase that is produced by the chief cells. So the chief cells will produce enzymes. So pepsinogen that will be converted into pepsin, then they can also produce gastric lipase. Then we have the D cells. The D cells, they will produce somatostatin. So the D cells, they will produce somatostatin and the somatostatin will inhibit the motility or the GIT to inhibit the secretions. So it will inhibit acid production. So somatostatin, it will inhibit the parietal cell to produce a lot of hydrochloric acid. So it's more like negative feedback control. It's going to control the quantity of hydrochloric acid that is going to be produced in the stomach. So if you have more acid, the D cells will be stimulated more to produce somatostatin. That will go and inhibit the production of the acids. So that will regulate the concentration of acids and also the volume or the acid that is being produced. Then on top of that, we have the G cells. The G cells produce a hormone, which is called gastrin. So the gastrin hormone can do the opposite, okay? So in function, it's opposite to that of somatostatin. Gastrin is going to stimulate the parietal cells to produce a lot of acids. So you find that gastrin is stimulated by the presence of proteins in the stomach, amino acids, peptides, carbohydrates and fat. So these G cells will produce a lot of gastrin and gastrin will enhance the production of hydrochloric acid by the pancreas and also the production of pepsinogen. Regulation of gastric secretions. So the important stimulatory signals that are there are autonomic nerves, which is the parasympathetic that is releasing acetylcholine to those cells to increase the production. So acetylcholine is going to stimulate the smooth muscle cell to contract, and it's also going to stimulate the chief cells, parietal cells, ECL cell, and the G cells. The chief cells are producing pepsinogen and gastric lipase. The parietal cells are producing 
hydrochloric acid and also intrinsic factor, the ECL, they are producing a lot of histamine that will enhance the production of hydrochloric acid. Then the GCLs they are producing gastrin. Okay, so all these will be stimulated by acetylcholine. The gastrin in turn, it will go and stimulate the parietal cells to increase the production of the acids and it will also stimulate the smooth muscle to contract. So the gastrin is going to stimulate the chief cells, the parietal cells and the ECL cells. So the ELC are the same, the ECL cells, the interochromaffin-like cells that are producing histamine. So the histamine will inhibit the production, uh, it will stimulate the production of acids. So the histamine is producing, is, is being produced by the ECL, then it will enhance the production of acids by stimulating the parietal cells. Then we have the protein products such as peptides and amino acids that are stimulating the G cells to produce a lot of gastrin. Then the acids will stimulate the D cells to produce a lot of somatostatins and the somatostatins will inhibit the production of the acids. So the presence of hydrogen ions that will stimulate the D cells to produce a lot of somatostatin and somatostatin is inhibitory to the parietal cell. So the production of acids, it's checked by the product that is coming from the D cells. So that is the somatostatin, okay? Phases of gastric secretions. So if a question comes to say, can you describe the phases of gastric secretions? Or if it just says, describe gastric secretions, you, are need, you need to divide the secretions into phases. So you have phases of gastric secretions. So the stomach adds a significant volume of digestive uh, secretions to the meal. So remember we said the stomach is adding about two liter of secretions per day. So two liter of gastric secretions per day. So it's going to add significant volume to the meal that you are eating in the stomach. So they are divided into three phases. So the stomach prepares itself to receive the meal before it is actually taken in. So during the cephalic phase of digestion. So the cephalic phase of digestion, the stomach is going to prepare itself even before you take in the food. So sight of nice food, you know, smell of nice food or taste of nice food, that can cause the stomach to release certain secretions. So it's called the cephalic phase of uh, secretion. So the stomach is producing secretions even before you take in the food. But what is happening is taking place within the head. That's why it's called the cephalic phase of gastric secretions, okay? So it will be influenced by food preferences. So whatever food you like, so if you like eating a lot of uh, meat, whenever you see meat being prepared, that can also enhance secretions in your stomach because the food that is being prepared is something that you like. So you start preparing yourself to receive the food. So the first phase is called cephalic phase. So sight of nice food, smell of nice food, and taste of nice food or thoughts of food. When you just sit there and then you start thinking of nice food, then you find that the secretions in the stomach will increase via the vagus nerve. So you have the central nervous system, you have vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10, that will send signals to stimulate the submucosa plexus. Remember, the submucosa is the one that is uh, controlling secretions. The myenteric plexus is the one that will control motility. So during the cephalic phase, the submucosa is going to be stimulated by the vagus nerve. This is the parasympathetic. Then the submucosa will stimulate the mucus cells to produce mucus. It will stimulate the chief cells to produce pepsinogen. It will stimulate the parietal cells to produce hydrochloric acid. It will stimulate the G cells to produce gastrin. And this gastrin will also go and overstimulate the chief cells and parietal cells to increase the production of acids and pepsinogen. So this is taking place before the ingester moves into the stomach. It's taking place 
when things are just being processed within the head. So it's called the cephalic phase. So sight, smell, taste, using your cerebral cortex, it can also stimulate certain centers within the brain. Then the parasympathetic vagus nerve is going to transmit action potentials to the submucosa plexus to increase the stimulation of the mucus cells, chief cells, parietal cells, G cells to increase whatever they are producing, okay? Then after the cephalic phase, we have the gastric phase. The gastric phase, this is when the stomach is filling with the ingester. So this in terms of quantity is the most significant. So quantitatively, the most significant phase in which gastric secretions are being produced. So it will increase the production of gastric secretions. This is when the foot has now moved into the, delta, uh, into the stomach. So you have the movement of the bolus into the stomach that will cause distension of the stomach. So there are stretch receptors that will trigger local reflexes. So those stretch effectors, once they are stretched, they are receptors sensitive to stretching. We also have chemoreceptors that are sensing the presence of products from digestion. So peptides, fat, carbohydrates, products can also stimulate the chemoreceptors. So those receptors of fire action potentials via the sensory nerve fiber, and these insulin fiber, they are communicating with the submucosa. So the submucosa plexus is going to be stimulated. Then in turn, it will go and stimulate the cells that are producing secretions, the mucus cells, parietal cells, chief cells, G cells. So now the production is even more here. So you can see in this diagram that is summarizing the same information. This is the gastric phase of gastric secretions. So now the, the bolus has moved into the stomach. So the receiving end of the stomach is called the orad part of the stomach or the orad region of the stomach that is composed of the, the cardia, the fundus, and the proximal part of the body. So the distension of this part of the stomach, it will stimulate the stretch receptors. The stretch receptors will trigger an action potential into the sensory nerve fiber. So via the stretch receptors and the chemoreceptors, that are responding to elevated pH and other chemicals of digestion, they are going to stimulate an action potential or they will initiate an action potential in the sensory fiber. This sensory fiber is projecting to the submucosa and the mentary plexus. Mentary plexus is going to increase the contractions. So you have the mixing contractions, peristaltic contractions, segmental contractions that are going to increase but the submucosa is going to increase the secretions. So the submucosa will stimulate the mucus cells, the chief cells, parietal cells, G cells to increase the production of mucus, pepsinogen, hydrochloric acid, and gastrin. Gastrin in turn, it will go and stimulate the chief cells and parietal cells to increase the production of pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid. And the same gastrin can also cause an increase in the motility of the stomach. So the mixing contractions are going to increase because gastrin can stimulate smooth muscle contraction as well. So it will cause depolarization of these smooth muscle cells. They will start contracting. So you have uh, uh, an increase in the mixing contractions. What is stimulating the G cells? Here are the digestive products of protein. So you have the digestive product of protein that will increase uh, gastrin secretion. Then the final phase is called the intestinal phase of gastric secretions that will occur when the meal has left the stomach. So now the chyme is being emptied into the duodena and the presence of chyme in the duodena will stimulate the production of certain hormones that will have an effect on gastric secretions. So here mainly is via the local and distant uh, reflexes or triggers. So this is the intestinal phase. So you can see the chyme is moving now from the stomach into the duodenum. The emptying of this chyme from the stomach into the duodenum will stimulate certain cells. So in the duodenum, the mucosa of the duodenum, we have the eye cells that produce cholecystokinin, 
we have the mucosal cells that can produce gastric inhibitory peptide. Then we have the A cells that can produce secretin. So the presence of lipids and carbohydrates, they can stimulate those cells that are producing cholecystokinin, which are the I cells and the other cells, the mucosal cells that produces gastric inhibitory peptide. Then the increase in hydrogen ions, the decrease in pH, which means the increase in hydrogen ions that is brought about because of the chyme that is moving from the stomach. It will contain a lot of hydrochloric acid. So those hydrochloric acid, they will stimulate the A cells to produce a lot of secretin. So these hormones now will be transported via the circulation. So you have blood vessels that will transport the, uh, the hormones to the stomach. So in the stomach, most of these hormones are inhibitory. So you can see they are inhibiting the chief cells. They are also inhibiting the parietal cells. They are also inhibiting muscle contraction. So you find that cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide, from the name itself, gastric inhibitory peptide, so all these are going to inhibit secretions. So you find that during intestinal 